changing with really remarkable speed. If you look at the chart at the top here, you'll see that in 2025, these Goldman Sachs projections suggest that the Chinese economy will be almost the same size as the American economy. And if you look at the chart for 2050, it's projected that the Chinese economy will be twice the size of the American economy and the Indian economy will be almost the same size as the American economy. And we should bear in mind here that these projections were drawn up before the Western financial crisis. A couple of weeks ago, I was looking at the latest uh, projection by BNP Paribas for when China will uh, have a larger economy than the United States. Goldman Sachs projected 2027. The post-crisis projection is 2020. That's just a decade away. China is going to change the world in two fundamental respects. First of all, it's a huge developing country with a population of 1.3 billion people, which has been growing for over 30 years at around 10% a year. And within a decade, it will have the largest economy in the world. Never before in the modern era has the largest economy in the world been that of a developing country rather than a developed country. Secondly, for the first time in the modern era, the dominant country in the world, which I think is what China will become, will be not from the West and from very, very different civilizational roots. Now, I know it's a widespread assumption in the West that as countries modernize, they also westernize. This is an illusion. It's an assumption that modernity is a product simply of competition, markets, and technology. It is not. It is also shaped equally by history and culture. China is not like the West, and it will not become like the West. It will remain in very fundamental respects uh, very different. Now, the big question here is obviously, well, how do, we, how do we make sense of China? How do we try and understand what China is? And the problem we have in the West at the moment, by and large, is that the conventional approach is that we understand it really in Western terms using Western ideas. We can't. Now, I want to offer you three building blocks for trying to understand what China is like, just as a beginning. The first is this that China is not really a nation state. Okay, it's called itself a nation state for the last hundred years. But everyone knows anything about China knows it's a lot older than this. This was what China looked with the victory of the Qin Dynasty in 221 BC at the end of the Warring State period, the birth of modern China. And you can see it against the boundaries of modern China. Or immediately afterwards, the Han Dynasty still 2,000 years ago, and you can see already it occupies most of what we now know as Eastern China, which is where the vast majority of Chinese lived then and lived now. Now, what is extraordinary about this is what gives China its sense of being China? What gives the Chinese the, the, the sense of what it is to be Chinese comes not from the last 100 years, not from the nation-state period, which is what happened in the West, but from the period, if you like, of the, of, of the civilization state. I'm thinking here, for example, of um, customs like uh, ancestral worship, of a very distinctive notion of the state, likewise a very distinctive notion of the family, social relationships like Guangxi, um, uh, Confucian values, and so on. These are all things that come from the period of the civilization state. In other words, China, unlike the Western states and like most countries in the world, is shaped by its sense of civilization, its existence as a civilization state, rather than as a nation state. And there's one other thing to add to this, and that is this. Of course, we know China's big, huge, demographically and geographically, with a population of 1.3 billion people. What we often don't really are aware of is the fact that China is extremely diverse and very pluralistic, and in many ways very decentralized. You can't run a place on this scale simply from Beijing, even though we think uh, this to be the case. It's never uh, been the case. 
So this is China, a civilization state rather than a nation state. Well, what does it mean? Well, I think it has all sorts of profound implications. I'll give you two quick ones. The first is that the most important political value for the Chinese is unity, is the maintenance of Chinese civilization. You know, 2,000 years ago, Europe broke down the fragmentation of the Holy Roman Empire. It divided, and it's remained divided ever since. China, over the same time period, went in exactly the opposite direction, very painfully holding this huge civilization, civilization state, together. The second is uh, maybe more prosaic, which is Hong Kong. Do you remember the handover of Hong Kong? Uh, by Britain to China in 1997. You may remember what the Chinese constitutional proposition was. One country, two systems. And I'll lay a wager that barely anyone in the West believed them. Ha! <sighs> window dressing. When China gets its hands on Hong Kong, that won't be the case. Thirteen years on, the political and legal system in Hong Kong is as different now as it was in 1997. We were wrong. Why we were wrong? We were wrong because we thought, naturally enough, in nation-state ways. Think of German unification, 1990. What happened? Well, basically, the East was swallowed by the West. One nation, one system. That is the nation-state mentality. But you can't run uh, a country like China, a civilization state, on the basis of one civilization, one system. It doesn't work. So, actually, the response of... Uh, China to the question of Hong Kong, as it will be to the question of Taiwan, was a natural response. One civilization, many systems. Let me offer you another building block to try and understand China. Maybe not sort of comfortable one. The Chinese have a very, very different conception of race to most other countries. Do you know, of the uh, 1.3 billion Chinese, over 90% of them think they belong to the same race, the Han. Now, this is completely different from the other world's most populous countries. India, the United States, Indonesia, Brazil. All of them are multiracial. The Chinese don't feel like that. The Ch the Ch China is only uh, uh, multiracial, really, uh, at the margins. So the question is why? Well, the reason, I think, essentially is Again, back to the civilization state. Very, very, you know, a, a history of at least 2,000 years. A history of conquest, occupation, absorption, assimilation, and so on, led to the process by which, over time, this notion of the Han emerged, of course, nurtured by a growing and very powerful sense of cultural identity. Now, the great advantage of this historical experience has been that without the Han, China could never have held together. The, 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 the Han identity has been the cement which has uh, held this country together. The great disadvantage of it is that the Han have a very weak conception of cultural difference. They really believe in uh, uh, their own superiority, and they are disrespectful uh, of those who are not, hence their attitude, for example, to the Uyghurs uh, and to the Tibetans. Or let me give you my third uh, building block, uh, the Chinese state. Now, the relationship between the state and society in China is very different from that uh, in the West. Now, we in the West overwhelmingly seem to think these days, at least, that the authority and legitimacy of the state is a function of democracy. The problem with this proposition is that the Chinese state enjoys more legitimacy and more authority amongst the Chinese than, any, than is true with any Western state. And the reason for this is because, well, there are two reasons, I think, and it's obviously got nothing to do with democracy, because in our terms, the Chinese certainly don't have a democracy. And the, but the reason for this is, firstly, because... The state in China is given a very special, uh, has, enjoys a very special significance as the representative, the embodiment, and the guardian of Chinese civilization, of the civilization state. 
This is as close as China gets to a kind of spiritual role. And the second reason is because whereas in Europe and North America the state's power is continuously challenged, I mean in European tradition, against, historically against the church, against other sections of the aristocracy, against merchants and so on, for 1,000 years the power of the Chinese state has not been challenged. It's had no serious rivals. So you can see that the way in which power has been constructed in China is very different from our experience in Western history. The result, by the way, is that the Chinese have a very different view of the state. Um, whereas we tend to view it as an intruder, a stranger, uh, certainly uh, an organ whose powers need to be limited or defined and constrained. The Chinese don't see the state like that at all. The Chinese view the state as an intimate, not just as an intimate actually, as a member of the family. Not just, in fact, as a member of the family, but as the head of the family, the patriarch of the family. This is the Chinese view of the state. Very, very different to ours. It's embedded in society in a different kind of way to, the, uh, to what is uh, the case uh, in the West. And I would suggest to you that actually what we are dealing with here in the Chinese context is a new kind of paradigm, which is different from anything we've had to uh, think about in the past. You know, the Ch the China believes in the market and the state. I mean, Adam Smith already writing in the late, eight, uh, the late 18th century said the Chinese market is larger and more developed and more sophisticated than anything uh, in Europe. And apart from the Mao period, that has remained more or less the case uh, ever since. But this is combined with an extremely strong and ubiquitous state. The state is everywhere in China. I mean, the, its leading firms, many of them are still uh, publicly owned. Private firms, however large they are like Lenovo, depend in many ways on state patronage. Targets for the economy and so on are set by the state. And the state, of course, its authority flows into lots of other areas, as we're familiar with, with something like the one-child policy. Moreover, this is a very old state tradition, a very old tradition of statecraft. I mean, if you want an illustration of this, the Great Wall is one. But this is another. This is the Grand Canal, which was constructed in the first instance in the 5th century BC and was finally completed in the 7th century AD. It went for... 1,114 miles linking Beijing with Hangzhou and Shanghai. So there's a long history of extraordinary state infrastructural projects in China, which I suppose helps us to explain what we see today, which is something like the Three Gorges Dam and many other expressions of state competence within China. So there we have Three building blocks for trying to understand the difference that is China. The civilization state, the notion of race, and the nature of the state in its relationship to society. And yet we still insist, by and large, in thinking that we can understand China by simply drawing on Western experience, looking at it through Western eyes, using Western concepts. If you want to know why we unerringly seem to get China wrong, our predictions about what's going to happen to China are incorrect, the re this is the reason. Unfortunately, I think, I have to say, that I think our attitude towards China is that of a kind of little Westerner mentality. You know, it's kind of arrogant. It's arrogant in the sense that we think that we are best and therefore we have the universal measure, and secondly, it's ignorant. We refuse to really address the issue of difference. You know, there's a very, very interesting uh, passage in a book by uh, Paul Cohen, the American historian, and Paul Cohen argues that the West think of its, thinks of itself as probably the most cosmopolitan of all cultures. But it's not. In many ways, it's the most parochial, because for 200 years, the West has been so dominant in the world that it's not 
really needed to understand other cultures, other civilizations, because at the end of the day, it could, if necessary by force, get its own way. Whereas those cultures, virtually the rest of the world in fact, which have been in a far weaker position vis-a-vis -vis the West, have been thereby forced to understand the West because of the West's presence in those societies. And therefore, they are, as a result, more cosmopolitan uh, in many ways uh, than the West. I mean, take the question of East Asia. East Asia, Japan, Korea, China, etc. A third of the world's population lives, lives, lives there. Now the largest economic region in the world. And I'll tell you now, the East Asianers, the people from East Asia, are far more knowledgeable about the West than the West is about uh, East Asia. Now this, is, this point is very germane, I'm afraid, uh, uh, to the present. Because what's happening, that, back to that chart at the beginning, the Goldman Sachs chart, what is happening is that very rapidly in historical terms, the world is being driven and shaped, not by the old developed countries, but by the developing world. I mean, we've seen this in terms of um, the G20 usurping very rapidly the position of the G7 or the G8. Uh, and there are two consequences of this. First, the West is rapidly losing its influence in the world. There was a dramatic illustration of this, actually, a year ago, Copenhagen Climate Change Conference. Europe was not at the final negotiating table. When did that last happen? I would wager it was probably about 200 years ago. And that is what is going to happen in the future. And the second implication is that the world will inevitably, as a consequence, become increasingly unfamiliar to us. Because it will be shaped by cultures and experiences and histories that we are not really familiar with or uh, conversant with. And alas, I'm afraid, take Europe, America is slightly different, uh, but Europeans, by and large, I have to say, are ignorant, are unaware about the way the world is changing. Uh, some people, uh, I've got a friend, an English friend in China, and he said, the continent is sleepwalking into oblivion. <laughs> well, maybe that's true, maybe that's uh, an exaggeration. But there's another problem which goes along with this, this, this lack of, this, that, that Europe is increasingly out of touch with the world, and that is a sort of a loss of a sense of the future. I mean, Europe was once, of course, commanded the future uh, in its confident, you know, take the 19th century, uh, for example. Uh, but this, alas, is no longer true. If you want to feel the future, if you want to taste the future, try China, those old Confucius. This is a railway station the like of which you've never seen before. It doesn't even look like a railway station. This is the new Guangzhou railway station for the high-speed trains. China already has more of the bigger network than any other country in the world and will soon have more than all the rest of the world put together. Or take this. Now, this is an idea, but it's an idea to be tried out shortly in a suburb of Beijing. Here you have a megabus. On the upper deck carries about 2,000 people. It travels on rails down a suburban road, and the cars travel underneath it. And it does speeds of up to about, up to about 100 miles an hour. Now, this is the way things are going to move, because China has a very specific problem, which is different from Europe and different to the United States. China has huge numbers of people and no space. So this is a solution to a situation where China is going to have many, many, many cities, over 20 million people. Okay, so how would I like to finish? Well, what should our attitude be towards this world that we see uh, rep very rapidly developing uh, before us? Uh, I think it, there'll be good things about it and there'll be bad things about it. But I want to argue above all a big picture positive for this world. You know, for 200 years, the world was essentially um, uh, governed by a fragment of the human population. That's what Europe and North America represented. The arrival of countries like China and India, between them 38% of the world's population, and others like Indonesia and Brazil and so on, represents 
the most important single act of democratization in the last 200 years. Civilizations and cultures which have been ignored, which had no voice, which were not listened to, which were not known about, will have a different sort of representation in this world. As humanists, we must welcome, surely, this transformation. And we will have to learn about these civilizations. This is, this big ship here was the one sailed in by Zheng He in the early 15th century on his great voyages around the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and across the Indian Ocean to East Africa. The little boat in front of it was the one in which 80 years later Christopher Columbus crossed the Atlantic. <laughs> or, look carefully at this silk scroll made by Zhuzhou in 1368. I think they're playing golf. Christ, the Chinese even invented golf. Welcome to the future. Thank you.